Ingalls, just what is the Center for Accelerating Innovation? Well, it's a startup think tank. It's going to focus on building innovation ecosystems for regions, states, countries. Um, we think that uh, the key to economic growth and prosperity uh, is an innovation-based economic development approach. And what we focus on is the uh, development of new ideas and entrepreneurs and then creating, if you will, the network and the infrastructure, the connections and the relationship that allow that idea to uh, uh, build, scale, and expand. But so. an, econo uh, an economic system, an ecosystem, an economy is more than just high tech. Is, are you saying that innovation is more than just high tech? Absolutely. A lot of people think of innovation as kind of products and gadgets and, you know, iPhones and iPads. But we can innovate business models, we can innovate marketing, we can innovate uh, organizational structures, and we should be thinking more than about the high-tech industry. We ought to be thinking about agriculture, for example, service industry, the retail industry. You know, the retail industry already is pretty innovative with all, you know, Amazon and online and those kinds of activities. So I, we think that every sector should be innovating and not just the kind of ones that we usually think of as IT, biotech you know, software, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Well, let's talk about the retail industry itself because, yes, it is very innovative because it has to be. Uh, customers are driving that and, and mm -hmm. there is a, is a strong desire to get more customers. Mm -hmm. uh, so can that same attitude be brought to other types of innovation? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, the, your point about customers is the key. Uh, the approach that we take to innovation is not so much a product approach, but rather a customer value creation approach, meaning let's understand user needs, customer needs, and then integrate backwards and try to pull together the different ideas that will satisfy that customer need. So we need a user-driven innovation model, you know, not one that's a push model, you know, trying to push a product out, but rather one that responds to what the real needs of the customer are. So. That's kind of a paradigm shift for a lot of companies. Retail mm -hmm. understands that pretty intimately because they realize their sales come very much from satisfying those uh, customer needs. So yeah, I think it's transferable, absolutely. So what do you think are the barriers to for other industries in terms of innovating? Well, I think there's been a big focus in industry on trying to achieve cost efficiency, you know, to drive productivity, try to squeeze costs out. That also leads to things like outsourcing and, you know, trying to find other, you know, expanding the supply chain. I mean, efficiency is important, but, uh, you know, other countries know how to be efficient. They know a lot about quality. They can kind of replicate what we do very quickly. So the key to success is uh, through innovation and the development of new kinds of ideas, products, and so on. So um, companies need to invest in research and development, creativity, try new innovation models which crowdsource ideas together. Um, and it's a kind of a change in mindset for a lot of industries that frequently focus on the bottom line of getting costs down, but they aren't looking at the top line of getting revenue growth. Mm -hmm. What kind of pushback do you get from industries? Because there's so many industries that we have here in the United States that are mature. Uh, and in the entire region that are mature, and so they're not used to having to change. Well, you know, the story of innovation tends to be the disruptive and new entrant displacing, the, if you will, the status quo. Mm -hmm. And uh, So you're a hellraiser. <laughs> sort of, yeah. But that tends to be the story. And, uh, you know, uh, when an industry kind of meets, a, gets up to that mature part of the life cycle, the reinvention process becomes very difficult because what they have to do is de-invent what they've been doing before they can begin to you know, put a new model in place, right? Uh -huh. And so usually that's a huge opportunity for new entrants to come in, entrepreneurs to come in and startups. And we see that process at work in the auto industry. We see that process at work in you know, taxi industry, you know, Uber and, and payment transaction things, uh, smart watches now are going to be a, a whole new category that are going to be able to monitor nine different vital signs and stream it to the cloud and we'll be able to improve our healthcare outcomes dramatically and mm -hmm. so, you know, some very exciting stuff's going on. This economic region is the Pacific Northwest, but it does face globally. Um, is the Pacific Northwest 
second or third or fifth on the list of, of innovators around the world, do you think? Well, I think our position is rising. Uh, you know, Rob Atkinson, good friend of mine, does in every two years an analysis of how the states are doing in terms of innovation. And uh, over the past four years, we've ranked in the top five. Uh, you know, Massachusetts ended up doing pretty well. California's back from its slump in a, in a good way. So uh, we have a tremendous number of innovation assets uh, here. And, you know, we're great leaders in manufacturing because of aerospace. We're great leaders in software, you know, in IT. We're great leaders in life sciences and medical devices. Uh, these are all powerful, strong areas. We have a big research and development infrastructure here in the state. And this meeting that we're at here is now connecting Washington State to our neighbors, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, BC, Alberta, Alaska, Northern Territories, Yukon. You know, uh, we need to be thinking of innovation not as within the boundaries of Washington State, but, uh, you know, the, the natural boundaries of innovation are much larger, right? So we're finding today all kinds of opportunities to uh, collaborate across borders. So is collaborating actually happening, or, or are people being territorial? Well, uh, we think collaboration's happening. Uh, a good example right here locally is that a hundred-year conflict between the Port of Tacoma and the Port of Seattle has now been resolved. The, the, the two ports have decided to work together because reality is forcing this kind of collaboration. You know, it didn't make any sense for us to be competing against each other. And I think we'll start discovering that we're not really competing with Canada. What we ought to do is be finding ways to collaborate with Canada on a number of issues and a number of opportunities. And I think that spirit is what this Penware meeting is all about. And, you know, there's a natural competition, obviously, between regions and states. But the, the opportunity to accelerate innovation by leveraging other people's assets and capabilities, you know, is, uh, is probably a bigger opportunity than trying to compete head on head. What is the rest of the globe asking of, of us in this region? Well, that's a very good question. What is the rest of the globe asking us? I don't know how many customers Washington State, I can speak to that, uh, serves, but you know, it might be a half a billion customers every day. Think about this. Every day, people are having a cup of Starbucks. Every day, people are flying a Boeing airplane. You know, every day someone's doing something on Amazon or, you know, downloading a book. You know, they're going to Nordstrom, you know, to buy something. They're going to Costco, you know, to buy whatever it is. This is a small state of six million people serving every day, you know, booting up on Microsoft. I mean, how many people there? I mean, half a billion? I don't know. We are serving customers all over the world. So the key to our success is to understand that customer down the road. What I find interesting is we have a growing nonprofit community here, uh, hundreds of interesting nonprofits, very much driven by the Gates Foundation as kind of the big uh, gorilla in, in, in that game. And they are solving global problems, you know, in the area of healthcare and health, you know, malaria, infectious diseases, problems of water, you know, food, housing, etc. Uh, I think. It's an example of the value creation that's possible by understanding what these global needs are and then creating businesses and business models to respond to what those needs are. So a couple of examples come to mind. One, one is, how do we move to low carbon prosperity and you know, have less impact on the environment? The technological innovation opportunities in that area are just fantastic in terms of renewables, batteries, electric cars, smart grid, you know, things that we can do there, biofuels. And we have tremendous capabilities in that area. So if that market demand begins to emerge, we are well positioned to do some things. Managing water, you know, this is one of the biggest problems around the world right now, clean water. Uh, we've been able to clean up the Puget Sound here and some of those solutions now are things that we could apply on a global basis. And the area of education, uh, uh, you know, we, we're a pioneer in online education here in the state. I mean, uh, and new ways of uh, learning. Uh, again, that solution here can be scaled, you know, across the world. So I think innovation is beginning to move into a space um, that is dealing with some of these uh, problems, social problems that people talk about and typically look to government 
you know, to be the solution provider. And I'm seeing the private sector beginning to see their role in actually being uh, the player and delivering those solutions to the world. So huge opportunity, I think, going, going forward. Five years from now, where is the uh, Center for Accelerating Innovation going to be? Well, I hope we're going to be working with uh, a few dozen uh, organizations around the United States and, and maybe globally, uh, helping them uh, implement uh, economic development strategies that are based on innovation and this kind of bottom-up and uh, you know, innov uh, innovation-driven model. And um, we'll be out there, as I say, working with universities and economic development agencies, state agencies, on doing that. I spent six years uh, doing the economic strategy for the state of Washington. We learned a lot. We created innovation partnership zones, 18 clusters, new innovation clusters across the state. We financed what are called entrepreneurs and residents. And these are guys that would work with universities and then find a good idea, good intellectual property, and build a business model around it and spin a startup out. This last year, 18 new company startups out of uh, University of Washington, you know, for example. Uh, we also helped uh, build some uh, exciting research teams in the area of biofuels, which are now Alaska Airlines and Boeing are actively involved with in our military, and also in the area of smart grid. And we have the cleanest electrical grid in the country because it's all almost hydro. A huge competitive advantage for us because uh, we're attracting data centers and energy intense manufacturing uh, like carbon fiber. And our carbon fiber plant in uh, eastern Washington now provides all the carbon fiber for the new BMW i3 electric car, which is manufactured in Europe. Eagles, thank you very much for being Thanks. Rainmaker believes we can change.